Fox, and my full name was too long here for this slot. Yet, so I'm going with that Arsenal on Twitter and on GitHub. So, uh, so uh, most of us have worked with a relational data model um, to restore our data in our application. So let's imagine the typical sales application where we have customers making orders, orders contain other items. Uh, which uh, contain products and we classify these products by product classes. So the question of that model is good for storing the individual transactions and doing uh, uh, individual transactions, but uh, when we got analytical queries on top of the data, for example, one day our CEO asked, asked the question, what were the total sales amounts in California in Q1 last year by product families? So we, uh, well, if we are Rails programmers, so we try to do everything using a rule methods. So it gets quite complicated. So and even if we look at the generated SQL, or if we would write this SQL by hand, well, it's um, it might get uh, quite complex uh, to do analytical queries. And so these are ad hoc queries that users are asking us all the time. And so we once tried to launch the Rails console and teach our business users, so it's quite easy to write uh, these data queries, and uh, unfortunately we failed. Uh, so, well, uh, what we can do? Well, we asked some consultants, they suggested us, well, you should use NoSQL, SQL is better than that. Or maybe uh, we can uh, just look into the history. That's some 20 years ago, so there were some books about that, about data warehouses and modern dimensional data modeling. And uh, what these techniques suggested that so what is this dimensional uh, modeling? Uh, when we look at these analytical uh, questions that our business users ask, and we try to identify the data model out of that. So typically, in these questions, we have some facts or measures we would like to analyze, like sales amount or quantity, etc. And we want to analyze these measures by some dimensions, like by customers or regions, by time, by products. And we should uh, use uh, this uh, dimensional, uh, these dimensions and measures when we are building our data structures uh, and uh, data query. And uh, so, so one technique is typically that we store our data, we reorganize or we store our data in the database in so-called data warehouses using this star scheme where we have these fact tables with these measures and then with foreign keys linked to these dimension tables. Uh, but, uh, so when we want to query the data, we probably don't want to limit us to this two-dimensional table model. And a uh, much better uh, data model is this multi-dimensional data model, where we imagine that we have this multi-dimensional data queue by all these different dimensions. And in the intersection of these dimensions, we store these measure values. Like in uh, our example, we have sales data queue, and we have a customer's product time dimension, and we have these measures like sales quantity, sales amount, sales cost, etc. And uh, in each dimension, we could have also different hierarchies. For example, customers we could aggregate by their geography, by cities, states, countries, etc. And there are technologies which handle these uh, multi-dimensional uh, data models quite well, and these are typically called these OLAP technologies or online analytical processing technologies. And one of the most popular open source projects uh, is the Mondrian, the uh, Pentaho Mondrian project, but uh, which is Java library. And therefore, so when I found it out, uh, and so some, some four years ago, uh, I created a Mondrian OLAP JRuby gem which wraps uh, this uh, Java library and uh, provides with some uh, additional yeah, good things. So, so the first thing I... Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, it, yeah, but, uh, to avoid writing XML schemas, we can do in Ruby DSL, describe the schema. And then when the business users ask these uh, business questions, so we get very short and concise uh, DSL for writing these queries, which generate uh, corresponding uh, MDX query statements, which processes by the Mondrian engine, and then which retrieves the data in uh, this multi dimensional data. And uh, yeah, so it does results caching so that when you retrieve, it, do the same queries multiple times, uh, so it, it gets from in memory cache, so it doesn't do SQL queries all the time. So you get some calculation formulas in addition to that. So uh, yeah, and yeah, so, so the, the, we, we use yeah, this 
underlying the technologies uh, which enables you to make some nice user front end what you do in the <laughs> If you were at Eurocam last year, you might think that you've already seen this talk, but you haven't. So the language I'm going to talk about just came out early this year, so you're mistaken. Um, so it's a new language that came out uh, a few months ago. It's imperative um, for a change, like all these new functional languages that just just ridiculous. Uh, this guy made it, a uh, pretty active guy in the community. Um, People don't see him around that much, but he, he's actually coding. So this is how it looks. It's pretty concise. Um, most of you will be familiar with it if you've done any Java or Go. So it's easy to learn. Like, don't worry about it. It's super minimal. It's not bloated at all. This is the, the minimum program you can write in some compilers of it. It's also very modular. It has a module system. Uh, it's called a C preprocessor, and you can just uh, include other modules so you can have your application separate in different files. It's really cool. It's also very clean. It's practical. It's not none of this Haskell bullshit. It's really practical, like to the point. It even has type inference. I mean, you don't need to annotate all the types. So if you put a string, literally, it knows that it's a string, and with the numbers, it knows that it, it's numbers. So that's quite smart. I mean. It's also very expressive. Um, you can practically do whatever you want. <laughs> it's pretty nice as well. It's a bit unsafe, but it gives you a lot of freedom. <laughs> it's really good. Freedom. <laughs> well, if you've done any Java, if it compiles, it probably works well. With these languages, if you could type it, it probably compiles. <laughs> That's even better. It also has a runtime polymorphism with void star, it's pretty nice. So you can have a, a function that takes uh, different arguments of different types. Um, it also supports great concurrency. Uh, forget about all these like new concurrency models. Threads, they were great. So no problem. It also supports efficient memory management. Uh, no garbage collection, that's just two flow. Uh, so you just free your references. That works pretty well. It's really fast, really fast. But not as in fast food, bad for you, but more like really fast and quick. And it has a vibrant community. I mean, you really can't beat that. Look at all this. All of this is in C, just a few months, all this software. What it doesn't have, it doesn't need. So we don't accept uh, pull requests, they say, from all these people trying to implement things. No. It's very fast. Did I say that already? It's really fast, really fast. And that's all you need to know. Thank you. Try it out and tell me how it went. So, um, <clears throat> I have a confession to make. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, uh, I made this website, which is uh, a biographical, basically a dictionary of biography of German designers of the 20th century that stayed in Germany during the period of the Third Reich, um, which is a, a project from a guy called Gerald Cinnamon, who's uh, one of the world's, world's most renowned typographers and historians of type typography. Uh, but um, this is what he gave me. This is a Word document. It had about 500,000 words in it. That's quite a lot of Word document. Um, but of course, it's just XML, because it's new Word, right? Just XML. Um, so we can use Nokagiri uh, to do stuff with it. But uh, have you seen Word XML? It's kind of this, <laughs> like, if you've ever done it, if there's anyone here written in any XSLT to XSLT, right? Who's done Munchian grouping? Right, this is like chthonic Munchian grouping you need to process um, XML from Word documents. You need XSLT too, because it makes it quite easy. But um, there's no XSLT in Nokagiri. No XSLT2, just XSLT1, because it's either uh, libxml in C or it's Xerxes in Java. Um, 
there's only one open source XLT2 processor. It's called Saxon. It's a Java library. It's really awesome. The guy who makes it is super nice. Um, have you seen the Java API for XML processing? So the real question is, uh, faced with a situation like this, do you write horrible code or do you try and do something about it? And actually, it turns out that if you don't like that, you can make it work like the thing that you do like. So I set out to make a gem uh, which wraps Saxon XL XLT processing and makes it look like Nakagiri. Um, and that is basically a thing that was so easy after I'd spent a bit of time getting my head around JRuby properly and getting my head around the Java interfaces. Um, I could knock something basic together in a weekend. And there's all these things that are super interesting and powerful that are really hard to use. But actually, you can turn them into something that is Ruby-like pretty straightforwardly. Um, things to remember, put gem platform Java in your gem spec so that people don't try and install it on CRuby and wonder why it doesn't work. Um, vendor the Java lib in your gem. Right, if it's a simple dependency, just vendor it in there so that people can do gem install just works. But the real thing is that you need to put extra work in to nail the API, because uh, you want to make something that allows people to write idiomatic Ruby, not just to shim around uh, a complex Java interface. Um, and that took me a little while, but I've got something that works just like Nakagiri. You wouldn't know the difference. You can just copy and paste code, change the require, just works. Uh, that's it. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, that's me. Uh, I can go away now.